Republicans got our butt kicked in the special elections of November 2023. I'm going to have a lot to say about that. How do we avoid that leading into 2024? Ronna McDaniel must go. Uh, in my opinion, the Republican Party seriously needs to learn how to message and to put the Democrat Party, who are absolutely destroying the country on offense or on defense, rather. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. I'm going to dive into Amendment Issue 1 that passed in Ohio, as well as Amendment issue two. And then we're going to have Stephen Mosier. Guys, you are going to want to listen to this interview that we're going to have with Stephen Mosier. Stephen Mosier is an expert when it comes to China, and he's going to make links to the Israel-Hamas uh, war, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, and China's advancement that he believes believes is going to occur on Taiwan. China is trying to be the big dog and replace America, and they just might do it. Stay tuned. This is The Carl Jackson Show. All right, welcome to The Carl Jackson Show, your daily dose of objective truth in a world of confusion and lies, or your weekly dose for those of you that might be tuning in uh, to the Salem News Channel. Guys, we got our butt kicked on Tuesday night, the special election. Let me just be straight up with you. Conventional campaigning is over. Do you get it, Republicans? Conventional campaigning is over. How you won in 2016, uh, 2020, 2022, all the ways in which we campaigned in those years, it's over. It's done. It's finito. I'm so sick and tired of Republicans uh, messaging and talking about polls, polls, polls every freaking day. The polls do not matter. They do not matter. Votes matter and ground games matter. I'm not even convinced that candidates matter as much. If we do not have a ground game, we cannot win. You tell me how we perform so poorly in Tuesday's elections when we got people that have credit card debt up the wazoo, they can't afford a home, they can't buy their food, they can't purchase gas, they, 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 the car prices, are, uh, you know, old and uh, uh, new car prices are absolutely insane. We're hollowing out the middle class. We're in wars. Russia and Ukraine, Israel, Hamas. I mean, the world is on fire under uh, uh, under Joe Biden, and we can't win. We got protesters dying in the street, and we can't win a freaking election. You tell me what's going on. And Ronald McDaniel has to go bye bye. This is insane. This is insane. I'm sorry. I did. I know this is for podcasting and TV. I did not want to start off hot, but I'm sick and tired of losing. And frankly, I'm sick and tired of the grift that's replacing the ground game within the Republican Party. I'm sick and tired of it. Are you tired of losing yet? Today or I, I, I mean, this past week, we heard tons of people on the right talk about, man, we can't talk about. We just overturned Roe v. Wade just over a year ago. And still, and still, you have a Republican Party and leadership that cannot figure out how to message on that, reframe instead of react to that issue and springboard onto other issues that will put Democrats on defense. Make them defend late-term abortion and what it does. Make them defend their economic policies. Make them defend the hollowing out of the middle class. Make them defend the lockdowns uh, during, uh, during 2020. Make them defend this stuff. Make them defend high gas prices. You're telling me that, uh, that Ronna McDaniel, frankly, we had a debate on Wednesday. We had special elections on Tuesday. There's a big problem there, in my opinion, regardless of how the debates went for, for any of the candidates. There's a big problem. You have a Virginia special election where we could have, where we could have taken over the Senate or, or, or the Democrats maintained the Senate. We could have flipped the House. You tell me why the RNC or even one of the GOP candidates did not take the initiative to say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to play as a team. Frankly, I think Trump should have been in Virginia right outside of the courtroom issues that he had earlier in the week. I think DeSantis, I think Nikki Haley, I think everybody should have uh, should have descended upon Virginia to make sure that we won that state. Guys, we, 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 we can't we can't keep playing the same game. We, we're not living in 2016 anymore. 
And frankly, we're not living in 2020. I'm just as upset as many of you about 2020. But damn it, we can win. We can win. But we have to show up. One of the reasons why we did not perform well in Kentucky was many of the base didn't show up. And many of the base that did show up, even Trump supporters, actually voted for Bashir. But still considering, we could have had better turnout. We have to convince Republicans that they can win. We have to convince Republicans uh, that we should win. We have to persuade. We have to woo our Republican voters again and not assume anything. Guys, I'm so sick and tired. Seriously, I started off the show with this. I'm so, so sick and tired every day. The, even conservative media, I've had to turn a lot of it off. It's turned into a clown show. Polls, polls, polls. I don't give a freak about the polls a year out. The polls don't mean jack crap. We have not. We have not even gotten to a primary race yet. We won't know if the polls are legit until we get closer to Iowa. We simply won't know. Everybody who's telling you otherwise is either uninformed or lying through their teeth. And I'm talking about even with the primary polling. We have no clue. There's a CNN poll that came out earlier in the week. And it puts Trump ahead of Biden. Uh, Trump 49. uh, Biden at 45. That poll doesn't matter. but, But I guarantee you, you heard it a thousand times this week. Even over conservative air. I guarantee you, it doesn't matter. We have a feckless dementia patient in the White House. And we got slaughtered. We got slaughtered on Tuesday because the Republican Party still does not have a ground game and does not know how to message. Now, not all Republican, uh, you know, uh, uh, enclaves are experiencing the same problem. But on a national level, we seem to be. We cannot seem to get our act together. And frankly, I got to say this. I got to be real. I know a lot of conservatives will be scared to say this, but I'm standing up for you. I want you to remember that because I know I'll take heat for this, but I'm standing up for you. One of the biggest personnel decisions, the worst personnel decisions that Donald Trump made, in my opinion, is staying neutral in this RNC fight with uh, with Ronna McDaniel at the time and Harmeet Dillon. Harmeet Dillon should be running the RNC, and I don't think we'd be losing in the same fashion in which we're losing. I'm not saying that we would win every race. Absolutely not. But I am convinced we would have better messaging. I am convinced we would have a better ground game. And I am convinced that we would have better lawfare. Guys, issue one, this amendment issue one passed in Ohio. Do you understand how insane this amendment is? Also, recreational drugs. Recreational marijuana has destroyed the state of Colorado. You have cartels doing business there. And now it's coming to the Midwest. China was already sending fentanyl to the Midwest. Now dumb behind Americans uh, are passing uh, this uh, uh, legalizing marijuana, recreational marijuana. We're doing it here in Florida. I'm telling you, this is not a smart idea. Why the heck would we not want sober voters? And we know that 90% of people are straight up lying when it comes to medicinal marijuana. They just want to smoke weed. Let's be real. Let's be honest. So now you get this Amendment 1, uh, this radical abortion bill that is enshrined into the Ohio Constitution, despite the fact, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this because I guarantee you haven't heard this. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, Ohioans oppose late-term abortion. Carl, how can you say that? They just passed issue number one. How could you possibly say that? They do. They do. These amendment processes, these ballot initiatives are a campaign that Democrats have launched along with major donors, the George Soroses of the world, in order to get these ballot initiatives on the uh, on uh, uh, on uh, during the elections so that people can vote for them. And they are cleverly worded. They're very confusing. 
They are very confusing. Half the time, people don't know exactly what they're voting for. You get a snippet of the amendment on the ballot. And then when you read the amendment in its entirety, it says a gang of things and legalese in pages long that you had no clue of. One thing Republicans need to do is they need to stop this ballot, uh, this, this amendment initiative by the left. They need to figure out in red states, you better start protecting yourself. You better make the laws as such where if you're going to uh, if you're going to implement an amendment, you need a higher uh, you need more than two thirds. You need 66 percent to 75 percent in order to get these amendments passed. And the wording must be done within three to four sentences in fifth grade level reading so that virtually everybody can understand, including Democrats. But now with this issue in, in, in Ohio, you have women that can have uh, a birth up to abortion. Uh, you know what that's going to mean, right? That's going to mean, in my opinion, you're going to see more women getting raped and having abortions. Because now, too, uh, you know, the, the, the late term abortions are there. Abortions for young girls without uh, consent of the parents is now uh, available in Ohio. There's going to be fertility decimating drugs that are available for teenagers. This is a uh, rapist uh, wonderland, if you will, a pedophile's wonderland in Ohio. Guys, we have to stop saying we can't win. We can win. We have to show up. And we need leadership. We need messaging. Abortion shouldn't be the major issue. Frankly, I think Republicans should be. Listen, just like Roe v. Wade, it is it is settled law. It is up to the states. But let's talk about your credit card debt. Let's talk about the fact that you can barely afford rent or you can't buy a house anymore under Obama. Let's talk about the, the, the fact that you can barely afford to put gas in your car or food on the table. Let's talk about those issues. Can we learn how to reframe in the Republican Party? I guess not. Oh, guys. All right. Enough of me ranting. When we come back, Stephen Moser, the author of The Bully of Asia, will be joining us. Stay tuned. All right. And welcome back to The Carl Jackson Show. I'm joined now by my guest, Stephen Moser. He has a... um, he has an insane uh, history. I don't even know how to word this, but he, I mean, his his background, uh, as far as his knowledge of China and the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, is, I mean, just absolutely in depth. So I'm going to introduce you to him now and we're going to get into what I believe is the greater uh, the greater threat that everyone seems to be falling asleep on, in my opinion. And that is the greater threat that is China, even as it relates to the Israel and Hamas war. Uh, we'll give you those connections. Stephen Moser, welcome to the Carl Jackson Show. It's good to be here, Carl. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen, you were just telling me something off air that I thought was, um, I didn't know. You were the first social scientist in China, uh, American. Uh, please explain that to our uh, viewing audience. Well, back in, uh, in January 15th of 1979, the uh, then president, uh, Jimmy Carter, normalized relations with the People's Republic of China after 30 years where China had been behind the bamboo curtain. I was then at uh, Stanford University teaching at the University of California, Berkeley. And because I had spent time in Hong Kong, I could read, write, and speak Chinese, I was selected to be the first uh, social scientist on the ground in China. I spent a year in country. I uh, found out lots of things, uh, the dark underside of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, according to the Chinese people. But uh, what really shocked me and I think shocked the world was I was there at the beginning of the one child policy. And I saw women arrested for the crime of being pregnant, the crime of being pregnant. It had not been a crime uh, before the Chinese Communist Party declared it to be in early 1980. I saw women arrested for the crime of being pregnant, locked up for weeks and, and even months until they uh, consented, consented in quotes to an abortion. Uh, all of these women were eventually taken into the local medical clinic and, uh, and forcibly aborted. And when I say forcibly aborted, the women who went in crying and screaming and, and, and saying, I don't want an abortion, were held down on the operating table and uh, forcibly aborted. Many of them were seven, eight, nine months pregnant. Um, the, the abortions were done by cesarean section abortion. Uh, I was in the operating room when these crimes against humanity uh, were being committed. Um, 
There were also babies that were being killed at birth. This was all part of the one child policy, you see, which ran uh, from when I was in China in 1980 all the way to 2016 and resulted in the deaths of probably, according to the Chinese Communist Party, 400 million unborn and newborn children were killed uh, as part of the one child uh, policy. Uh, that's about half of the last two generations of Chinese. So I think, uh, you know, I call the Chinese Communist Party the, the biggest killing machine in human history, not just because of the Great Leap Forward and the famine that killed 50 million people starving them to death, not just because of the Cultural Revolution, but because of the one child policy and, and the brutality, uh, the atrocities that accompanied it. Now, of course, they're going to the other extreme. They've got a population shortage. The population is declining. They've got too few young people. And so now they're telling young women they must get married and have children. Uh, guess what's just around the corner? Uh, following 35 years of forced abortion, we may see in China in the future forced pregnancy. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I I, I, I was uh, hesitant to even try to respond to that, uh, to that question, Stephen. Um, I, I don't even want to imagine necessarily how that would occur, but uh, being a communist party, I think uh, I think we can all imagine. I, I'm I am curious, how is it that you managed to get inside of these, uh, you know, abortion rooms or, or or the hospital to watch this stuff? Did did they allow you inside of the room? I I, I don't understand. Yeah, here, here's what happened. It was really a unique opportunity. Uh, the president Jimmy Carter had had a meeting with then China's leader uh, Deng Xiaoping. Premier Deng Xiaoping, and uh, and the Chinese side had turned down my research initially, and and Carter said, "What's wrong? You know, we have this American social scientist from Stanford who wants to go and and do research in China, and Deng Xiaoping, who wanted what he wanted American technology, he got it later. He wanted American uh, finance. He got trillions of dollars of investments. He wanted America to open its markets to Chinese goods. We see our big box stores stocked to the shelves, stocked to the ceiling with yes. Chinese made goods now. So he got everything he wanted. And he said, oh, it won't be a problem. Mayor Wanti, it won't be a problem. We'll allow your, your American uh, social scientists to come and do research in China. And so when China's senior leader gave permission no officials at the local level, Carl, dared interfere. Well, I know that when I was in the operating room in that local medical center where they were doing cesarean section abortions, assembly line fashion, bringing them in, opening them up like tin cans, taking out the babies, lethal injections to the babies, mothers stitched up and put back in the, uh, in the waiting room. Uh, they were doing them assembly line. The, the director of the hospital ran over to the local Communist Party chief and said, uh, the foreigner is in the operating room. And the local party official said, threw up his hands and said, there's nothing I can do. He has permission from senior leader Deng Xiaoping to be here. So it was really a unique opportunity. I was, as you can imagine, uh, after I began to publish and, and talk about what I'd seen, I was declared by the Chinese Communist Party to be an international spy. <laughs> an wow. international spy. And uh, they, they, they don't like me very much even today. But that's, yeah, how I can, I got in, that's how I got in the operating room. I can imagine. And, and again, I'm speaking to my guest, Stephen Mosier. He is the author of the book and others as well. But The Bully of Asia, make sure you go out and get that book. But uh, recently I ran across an article on the New York Post that Stephen had written. And I wanted to bring him on to talk about this because uh, with the Israel Hamas war that is going on. And I'm so thankful uh, that the Israeli people are ignoring the Biden administration. I mean, even uh, former Secretary of, uh, of, of Defense uh, Gates said that Biden had not been correct in, uh, on any foreign policy issue for 40 years. And that was approximately 10 years ago. I think he's got a 50 year streak now, uh, Stephen. Uh, but, uh, but you wrote a column for the New York Post entitled How China is Stoking a New Cold, Cold War uh, with the West. And this is what I would like to talk about. So I've got several questions uh, that I'd like to throw your way. Uh, so if we can get through as many of these questions as possible, uh, that would be great. But one of the things that you mentioned, actually, I'm getting ahead on my notes. I literally have three pages of notes. I don't know how we'll have enough time here, Stephen, uh, but I want to get through as much as possible. Uh, you say uh, you start off this column by saying, pick any terrorist group, rogue regime or horrific conflict in the, in the world today, and you'll likely find that China is behind it. We can look at Hamas. After the Hamas terrorist attack against Israel on October 7th, uh, the uh, the Chinese uh, communist media claimed that Israel 
uh, with the encouragement of the U.S., was the one that was carrying out indiscriminate attacks against Gazans. So right away, even at the height of a height of 10-7, already you have the Chinese Communist Party uh, just straight up playing a propaganda game against Israel. Why? Yeah, it was it was instantaneous. Uh, as soon as the attacks occurred, the Chinese social media was just filled with hateful screeds. Uh, we had we had prominent Chinese influencers uh, say things like Hamas is still too gentle. Israel is a Jewish version of Nazism and militarism. It needs to be eliminated. Uh, repeating this this slogan, you know, from the river to the sea. Uh, so they 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 obviously were pre-programmed, pre-positioned, ready to attack Israel as soon as the Hamas attack occurred. And and how did they know in advance it was going to occur? I believe it was because they green lighted it. I believe we know that the Palestinian leaders, the Iranian leaders, were in Beijing just a few weeks before the attack. And I believe that these, uh, the, the possibility of an attack was discussed and that China greenlighted it and promised its support. Same thing we saw in Russia before Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Putin traveled to Beijing, met with China's leader, Xi Jinping, and they signed a, an agreement, six different agreements, in fact, which are tantamount to a quasi-military alliance. And of course, we've seen China shipping aid and, and other support, uh, not just propaganda support, but, but real weapons uh, to Russia to help in its invasion of Ukraine. So whenever a conflagration occurs in the world, uh, you have to look at the what, what's going on behind the scenes. What's going on behind the scenes is China is stoking conflict everywhere. Why? Because it wants to disperse our forces. We only have so many carrier task sure. forces. We only have so many, um, you know, expeditionary force, marine expeditionary groups. And if they disperse our forces as they're doing, and they deplete our munitions, and our munition sources supplies are way down now, we can't produce them fast enough to replenish the stocks we're using, uh, then it makes it easier for them in the future to light new fires. And, and the goal, of course, is to take back Taiwan. But that's just step number one in an ongoing process that I believe, according to Chinese propaganda, that I believe is intent upon uh, dominating the world. They've got a 100-year plan. It started in, 20, in 1949 when they took over China, and the 100-year plan ends in 2049 when the Communist Party wants to be the dominant force in the entire world. And that's their long-term plan, and that's what they're following in the Middle East, in Russia, Ukraine, and building up, of course, for an invasion of Taiwan. All right. Now, I'm speaking to Stephen Moser. Stephen, we only have about 30 seconds here before the break, and I'll bring you back uh, to speak on this another segment because I want to get into the nitty gritty when it comes to Israel and Hamas. This is a very important conversation. It's it's an it's a conversation, in my opinion, that not that not enough people are are, are, are far too few people in the media, even conservative media are having. China is working their way into being the big global dog. Uh, and Stephen Mosier writes about this. Of course, I'm using my words here, but it's very important. I want you to follow this man. He spell his name uh, Mosier, M-O-S-H-E-R. Make sure you go out and get his book, The Bully of Asia. Very, very important. We'll return more with Stephen Mosier when we get back. This is The Carl Jackson Show. All right, welcome back to the Carl Jackson Show. Again, I'm joined by my guest, Stephen Moser. Make sure you go out his book. Go out and get his book. I'm sorry. He is the author of The Bully of Asia. Uh, and what we're talking about today um, is a column that he wrote for the New York Post a couple of weeks or so ago, and it's entitled How China is Stoking a New Cold War uh, with the West. This is a very, very important topic because I really do believe that what we've done is we're watching the Israel-Hamas war, uh, and I, I pray to God that uh, Israel eliminates every single Hamas terrorist, uh, frankly, but also there is a greater threat that we need to be talking about, and that threat is China. And it seems to me that we're being distracted, but China is not distracted. As you heard Stephen Moser explain in the last segment of the program, China has the uh, the Chinese Communist Party. They have a 100 year plan. We currently have Joe Biden in the White House that hasn't been correct on any foreign policy issue in in a half century. And he's definitely, definitely does not know what he's doing uh, when it comes to China. OK, so Stephen, welcome back uh, to the program. We were talking about China's 
you know, propaganda campaign against Israel, uh, so on, et cetera. Yeah, there were so many things that you were meant you mentioned that it was just it's just kind of unbelievable. But I want to hone in real quick on what's happening with Israel in Hamas uh, and Hamas, the Israel Hamas war, which essentially is, in my opinion, uh, Israel and Iran. Uh, you know, and, and with Hamas and both Hezbollah uh, being the proxies, but but it seems to me that China and you wrote about this, um, China is using Iran as well. So if we get into uh, the the minutia, if you will, the Israel and Hamas war, you suggest in your column that China had to have played a role in the attack or the ten seven against Israel because of the sophistication of the attack when it comes to communications, when it comes to their, uh, uh, their, their, their defense wall, breaking, kind of break, getting through that barrier. Talk to us about that a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, the Hamas, obviously, this, this terrorist group, it does not have the ability uh, to take down uh, the, uh, the security network, the uh, cyber, cyber security forces in uh, Israel, which is a first world country. And I think they had to have uh, help from uh, not just Iran, Iran's clever, but not that clever, uh, but from China itself uh, to help them take down uh, China's, uh, uh, rather China helped them take down the, the internet service, the security service uh, of the Israeli government and left them, I think, essentially blind uh, when Hamas came across the border and began attacking the Israeli kibbutzes in southern Israel. Uh, but the other thing I think that happened that people have mostly failed to notice is that a couple of years ago, when the planning for this attack began, Hamas ditched all of its uh, foreign-made, uh, U.S.-made, um, and, and European-made communications devices. Uh, they, gave, they gave away all their phones. Uh, they discarded all of their old computers. And they bought electronic equipment made in China. And they, brought, they bought Huawei phones. And Huawei phones two years ago just started uh, using their own operating system. So I think that the Chinese Communist Party was listening in to everything that Hamas was doing. And the Israeli intelligence perhaps found it a little more difficult because they were using Chinese devices with a Chinese operating program. I think that's how they broke down Israeli's defenses. I think that's how they hid the attack uh, from the West with China's help. Uh, and the other thing, of course, was that... Uh, the, the, the Chinese have been training uh, terrorists in China uh, for a long, long time. We know that the, uh, the leader, the mastermind behind the Hamas attack on Israel, a man named Mohammed Deev, actually studied in China in the late 1990s. Uh, where did he go? Well, he went to a P PLA, People's Liberation Army, uh, military university, and he studied ordnance engineering, that is to say, how to create bombs and blow up things. And there <laughs> he learned the skills that he later used to kill Israelis. Now, a very interesting fact is that when he was in China 25 years ago, uh, he acquired a, a Muslim wife. Not a Uyghur Muslim, not a minority Muslim. The minorities in China are under attack. The Uyghurs are, are of course, being, being genocided, if I can turn that into a verb. Uh, but he got a Chinese Muslim wife uh, that went back with him to uh, Gaza, and we believe is a back uh, is a back uh, co uh, uh, you know conduit to communications between Beijing and Hamas. So unbelievable. Uh, you see all kinds of connections between Hamas and the terrorist attack and China itself, including even some of the weapons uh, that seem to be far too sophisticated for Hamas to have manufactured yes. on their own. Even you know the technology obviously came from China. Um, the, the pipes that are used to create the missiles uh, that Hamas fires at Israel, the pipe is made in China. So a, a lot of the components of what uh, Hamas is using to attack Israel actually come from China, either directly or indirectly through Iran. Isn't it true as well? I mean, even the RPGs, even though they're manufactured apparently in Iran and North Korea, as you mentioned, they've gotten a little more sophisticated. They've gotten more precise and accurate. Uh, do you suspect that technology used on those RPGs are from China? Yeah, I mean, the thermobaric rocket propelled grenades, the RPGs that have disabled some, uh, you know, uh, 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 Israeli tanks was made, developed in China. And so, again, uh, you have to arm and train and uh, help with the communications of a terrorist group, I think you're responsible 
uh, for the terrorist attacks that followed. Now, a lot of people don't want to say that. I will say the axis of evil is not just Iran and Russia, but it's China as well. And I think China is now yes. the dominant power in that axis of evil. Uh, we had President Biden uh, get up and give a long speech about Hamas and, and in which he, he mentioned Russia. Uh, he mentioned Hamas. He even mentioned Iran. But somehow he went silent where China was concerned. I wonder why that is. Yeah, this is, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. And we're speaking again to Stephen uh, Mosier. Make sure you go out and get his book, The Bully of Asia. Uh, very, uh, very important work. And make sure you read his columns wherever you can find them. That is Stephen Mosier, spelled M-O-S-H-E-R. But you're absolutely right, Stephen. I do believe uh, that China is part of the uh, the axis of evil. There's no doubt about it in my mind. I mean, these guys. Uh, these guys are playing for keeps. I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, these guys are fighting a long term war, a 100 uh, year plan. They want to be uh, the uh, the global dominating uh, dominating force around the world. Whereas, you know, Russia was fighting this or we were fighting this Cold War against Russia back in the day where they were leading the charge. Now it is China that seems to be leading the charge to undermine the West. And they're willing to use um, Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, and, and I think, as you wrote in the column, that basically, uh, and you've mentioned it earlier as well, uh, but Putin went and, and essentially consulted with Xi Jinping, probably got the green light to go ahead and invade Ukraine uh, through Xi Jinping. And then we have this uh, bumbling idiot in the White House that is literally trying to fight wars, it seems to me, on all fronts, sending all types of money all different places. And I, I mean, just just winnowing out our military, our weaponry. It's insane. I, I honestly I, and, and he's compromised and he's compromised, Steve. Uh, so this is a uh, I mean, we are living in scary times. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I do want you to elaborate. Would you elaborate on Russia? Uh, Russia, Ukraine, and China's influence on in that war as you see it? Well, you know, you already mentioned uh, that uh, China and Russia were in an alliance back in the 1950s. That We call that the Sino-Soviet alliance. The Soviet Union then was the dominant power. China was weak. It had a large population, but very low per capita income, didn't make anything much, and didn't have any big manufacturing base. Now the roles are reversed. Uh, you've got China with the, the largest uh, manufacturing base in the world now. Uh, you've got China still with a, a large population. Now it's second to India because uh, India has overtaken China in population because China killed off so many of the last two generations. But, but China is the dominant power in this new uh, quasi-alliance between itself and Russia. Russia is a source of, uh, it's, a, it's an oil, <laughs> it's a gas station. Uh, it has a lot of natural resources. But if you combine... Russia's natural resources with China's population and manufacturing base, you know, you've got a power capable of dominating the world. And, and this administration willy nilly has, has driven Russia and China together, is recreating our worst nightmare of the last century, which is a new China Russia alliance able to dominate the Eurasian continent. And we see it on the march. Uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we now see it on the march in the Middle East as well. And I think as soon as our forces are depleted enough and dispersed enough that China will move against Taiwan. Lots of signs that Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, is gearing up for an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, he's building lots of car ferries that can be transformed into uh, uh, troop carriers to get across the 100-mile-wide Taiwan Straits. He's gearing up production in the state-owned enterprises. He's putting the People's Liberation Army colonels in each of the state-owned enterprises to make sure that when the time comes, uh, they can stop making electric cars and, and start making tanks, uh, stop making this uh, drones for civilian use and start making drones for attack. So there are lots of the militarization of the economy is occurring apace. He's fired about half of his uh, Central Military Commission, putting in place generals who will follow his, his orders when he says to attack Taiwan. They will actually carry out that order. So if you look at uh, all of the signs and recruiting lots of new members to the military as well, he's launching a recruiting campaign to both. 20 seconds here, Stephen. What is already the largest military in the world. OK, again, I'm speaking to Stephen Moser. Stephen, I'm going to ask you to return just for at least a half segment. I ran across a column that I want to ask you about. Biden briefed on China's plans for first military base in the Middle East. I want to get your take on that when we get back. Stephen Moser, I'm Carl Jackson. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to the Carl Jackson Show. Uh, guys, obviously, uh, listen, this has been a jam-packed show. Uh, we discussed uh, what happened in the uh, elections last night, the 2023 special elections. Wasn't great news for Republicans, but I wanted to bring uh, Stephen Mosier on because, uh, you know, obviously Israel and Hamas uh, is in the uh, in the news. The war is in the news, but there is a bigger threat, I believe. And I believe all of this Israel, Hamas, Russia, Ukraine, uh, I believe that uh, China has their hands in all of these wars. Stephen Mosier writes about it. So I encourage you again, go out and get his book, The Bully of Asia. And read his column um, uh, that I uh, that I read, and, and now I forget the name of it here, Stephen. Let me, uh, but uh, let me check my notes here. How China is stoking a new Cold War with uh, with the West, and we have a completely feckless uh, president in the White House and his administration at this point in time. But Stephen, as I was doing uh, research to prepare for you, I ran across a column uh, here at Zero Hedge, and it is titled, Biden Briefed on China's Plan for First Military Base in the Middle East. I want to get your, your uh, take on this. Well, China is uh, buying and building um, uh, naval bases all over the world. It has invested in 100 ports around the world. It controls the entrance and the exit to the Panama Canal, which we used to own. It is building a naval base in Cambodia to control traffic uh, through the Straits of Malacca uh, between Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And it already has a naval base in Djibouti, which is on the Horn of Africa, that controls access to the Red Sea. Now they want a naval base in Oman to control access to the Persian Gulf. This is all quite deliberate. Uh, China is looking back 100 years in history to the day when Great Britain ruled the waves. How did they do it? They controlled strategic maritime choke points. China is trying now to buy up and control and build military bases at strategic maritime choke points to choke off the ability of America to surge forces around the world. We've got a carrier task force coming down the Red Sea right now. They've got a naval base in Djibouti. They could shut off the Red Sea and prevent that carrier task task force from exiting the Red Sea in the future. That's how choke points work. They choke you off. They prevent you from deploying your resources, your military units around the world. This is quite deliberate. It's long term. It's strategic. And uh, and, and and we're not paying attention. Stephen, let me ask you this. How dangerous is it as well for our manufacturing base uh, in the United States, if China is controlling the choke points, and they make, uh, if if I recall correctly, approximately eighty percent of our medicine over the, uh, yeah, of our uh, of our medicine here. Yeah, I mean, it's all strategic. The reason why we don't make penicillin in this country anymore is because the Chinese Communist Party subsidized its manufacture in China. And so the American manufacturer shut down. They couldn't compete with the, the state subsidized prices for medicine. You see this in many, many different fields. When China decides to dominate artificial intelligence or decides to dominate robotics or decides to dominate this or that sector of high tech, they pump enormous amounts of money into it. They pump enormous amounts of money into a spying effort in the United States to steal the technology so they don't have to spend billions of dollars research and developing it. They just sim simply steal it from us on the cheap. Uh, and, and there you go. You have uh, they leapfrog over us. And, and go, look, we have over the last 30 years uh, enabled the rise of a power that wants to destroy us. And we've got to get wise. We've got to get smart. We've got to cut off uh, these ties with China. We've got to decouple from China now. Uh, otherwise, in the future, it'll be too late. You know what, Stephen, I was just going to ask you, I'm glad you mentioned that. What do we need to do to gain or to regain control and regain the upper hand uh, against China? And you named uh, a couple of things. Can you be a little more specific, things that you would recommend uh, the uh, U.S. government does, uh, I mean, effective immediately? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not, you know, the Biden administration says its policy towards China is de-risking. Well, the whole relationship with China is a risk to America's future and, and to the future of Americans. And so we have to decouple, not just de-risk, but decouple. That means we adopt the same policy towards China that we used successfully in the 1980s to take down the Soviet Union. We deny it technology. We deny it capital because they run at a deficit. They need trillions of dollars of investment. And we deny the 
the access of Chinese state-owned manufacturers to our big box stores to the biggest consumer market in the world, which is the United States of America. And if we deny them technology capital and stop buying their goods or put tariffs on their goods, uh, that Chinese economy will collapse. Communism always collapses from its internal contradictions if we don't continue to help it, and we should stop helping it uh, today. I love that. Last question that I have for you, Stephen, before we uh, let you go here. Uh, We left $85 billion approximately in military equipment behind in Afghanistan uh, to, uh, you know, and and, and the the Taliban supposedly uh, took all of that equipment. Any... Any thoughts on that? I I, I would suspect that the Taliban perhaps sold some of that equipment uh, to the Chinese government where they reverse engineered it. Am I far off? Is that a fairy tale thought here? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Reverse engineered, buying buying U.S. military equipment, uh, stealing it. Look, people need to realize that on his first day in office, President Biden did away with the China task force of the FBI. The China espionage, counter espionage task force was intended to stop spying. Wait, 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 Stephen, Stephen, I'm I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm totally oblivious to, to, to this. Restate what you just said, please. I did not know this. There was a, under Trump, there was a, a counter espionage unit set up within the FBI to track and stop uh, Chinese espionage, stealing our military secrets, stealing our commercial secrets. And and on his first day in office, uh, Joe Biden, in what I believe was a quid pro quo, abolished the FBI counter espionage task force. And uh, no one has been has been seriously tracking uh, Chinese espionage in the United States since. Okay, that is uh, that is absolutely insane. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stephen, listen, we're 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 going to have to uh, leave it there. You've been a wealth of knowledge. I look forward to having uh, having you back. Please go out and get the book, uh, "The Bully of Asia." Stephen Mosier uh, is his name. Thank you so much, Stephen. God bless you, man. Appreciate it. All right, I'm so thankful for Stephen Mosier joining us as a guest. Again, make sure you go out and get his book, The Bully of Asia. Uh, The gentleman is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. Again, he was the first U.S. uh, uh, scientist on the ground once the uh, CCP took over, witnessed the forced abortions for himself. Absolutely insane. And guys, listen, I, I want to be emphatically clear here. There is a bigger threat at stake, and that is the Chinese Communist Party. They are coming after us. But the reason why the Chinese Communist Party senses that we're weak is because of self-inflicted injuries right here within the United States. However, before I, I want to mention a few things. However, before I get on to that, I do want to share this. This was a very important headline that you may have missed earlier in the week. Uh, This according to Just the News. But Russia withdrew uh, from the arms treaty with NATO. I'm not sure if you heard that with all of the distracting news, but it's very important. So on Tuesday... uh, on, on Tuesday, uh, Russia withdrew uh, from the uh, Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, uh, causing the U.S. and our NATO allies to suspend the major agreement, which limited the number of military vehicles and weapons that could be deployed in Europe. The U.S. will formally suspend its participation in the treaty beginning on December 7th. That's just some of what else is going on, and I think that adds to the point that Stephen Mosier was making is that we are looking at a China, Russia, and Iran, the new evil axis. You can throw, in my opinion, North Korea in there as well. But I do want to bring you back to the home front. I want to bring you back to the home front. Guys, I hate to say this, uh, but I have to say it because I believe that is it is the objective truth. And that's what we strive to do here and give you and bring you on the Carl Jackson Show. And that is the truth. The left is an enemy of America. Make no bones about it. Guys, isn't it isn't it kind of funny? And, and perhaps funny is not the right word. Suspicious uh, may be a better word uh, when when you have conservatives or right-leaning people that show up at rallies, uh, you have you have conservatives that are often called the violent ones. Yet, yeah. uh, let me talk to you about some people uh, that have been uh, that have been killed. Uh, that is Paul Kessler. I want to get into him. Sixty-nine years old, Jewish man that attended a rally in California, 
Uh, he was killed, and the news media is scared to talk about it. He attended a, it was a pro-Palestinian, which I'm calling a pro-Hamas rally in California. He was on the pro he was on the pro-Israeli side, obviously. You have the news media tying themselves in not trying to avoid saying that this guy was actually killed, that it was a homicide. He was bashed in the head by a pro-Hamas protester, aka pro-Palestinian, before he fell to the ground, busting his head and eventually dying the next day from internal injuries and internal bleeding. Then we also have Ashley Babbitt. You guys remember Ashley Babbitt that was shot in the neck uh, at the U.S. Capitol. So isn't it amazing that the left is always calling us us, the violent ones, yet it is our people dying. And then obviously you had the uh, trans terrorist shooting uh, in Tennessee uh, that uh, where the where the parts of the manifesto were just leaked, where it turns out that the trans terrorist was literally a bigot, a class warfare type person and completely insane. We are living in crazy times and guys, it is time to wake up. We just lost some major elections. China is on the march and we have uh, Republicans and or conservatives being killed in the streets in America. Guys, until next time, don't grow weary, doing good. God bless you.